Good morning, Mets fans, and welcome to a Wednesday edition of Driving with Mr. Met. I am Mr. Met, and the Mets won again last night, defeating the Diamondbacks by a narrow margin, 3-2. to two. It wasn't painless. It was nerve-wracking. I was biting what's left of my nails the entire time. Justin Wilson pulled it out in the end. I'm going to talk about the game. I'm also going to talk about the fact that the Mets picked up a game on the Cubs after they were walked off by the Padres last night. And I'm going to touch on something I missed yesterday, which is the whole situation with Noah Syndergaard and Wilson Ramos and personal catchers and stuff. So I'll do that on today's show, and we're going to do that right now. A night after Jacob deGrom was brilliant, it was Zach Wheeler's chance to get the ball as the starting pitcher for the Mets. And while he wasn't quite as good as Jake, he was pretty damn good. Wheeler kept the Diamondbacks off balance last night. Um, for the most part, kept his pitch count under control after getting um, a, tough t a tough first inning for sure under his belt and throwing a lot more pitches in the second and third. But he really settled in toward the middle of the game. And Wheeler, as we know, tossed seven innings, gave up uh, three, I'm sorry, gave up one run, um, nearly gave up a, a second one on a home run by, a uh, near home run by Ketel Marte um, that just didn't go out. Um, but Wheeler danced around trouble again, pitched well, seven innings, and then it was the bullpen's turn, and that was when things got dicey. Um, <laughs> the uh, first, you know, what even Gelbsy said it, um, Ron Darling said it, Gary Cohen said it, like, what are they going to do in the bullpen tonight? Because Lugo pitched two. Yes, he only threw 21 pitches through his two innings of work, but is he going to be available tonight? And, of course, the answer was maybe not. Um, there was no definitive no, but the decision was made to go to Brad Brock in the seventh inning, uh, sorry, the uh, top of the eighth inning. And then you're, uh, I was like, oh, God, anybody but, <laughs> anybody but Familia to protect this lead and anybody but Diaz to protect this lead. And that was the only thing, those are the only things I was thinking about. Um, so I'm like, you know, Brad Brock, proven major league reliever, had an off year, Mets got him, he's going to do fine. What does Brad Brock do? He gives up a home run to, sling, to slice the lead to three to two. <laughs> so, you know, as if it wasn't tight enough, now it's three two. Brock comes out of the game in favor of Justin Wilson. Justin Wilson gets out of the eighth inning, and as we go to commercial break, as uh, as as we go to commercial, um, the uh, the camera. I think it was either as we were going to commercial, or or right after we came back from from commercial, or, or, or maybe in the middle of that, whatever it was. But the camera showed Edwin Diaz warming up, and my my heart like jumped out of my chest. I was like, oh well, that's that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> Of course, we didn't need to go to Edwin Diaz. Diaz stayed in the bullpen just getting his work in or whatever he was doing, not pitching and not costing the Mets the game. And instead, it was Justin Wilson who didn't get the save easily, um, wound up having to strike out Lerma Flores after putting two guys on base. Um, a really strange, strange turn of events on a play, on, on a sharp ground ball hit to Pete Alonso with the tying run on third base, uh, runner on first, Alonzo fields the ball like three feet away from the base runner. Um, and, and Alonzo could very easily have tagged the runner and stepped on first and turned a double play. Um, that did not happen. Alonzo simply stepped on the base. The runner returned to first and I only got one out. And it was just an odd, a really odd play. And it, it, it prolonged the inning. And it didn't end up hurting the Mets, of course, because the Mets ended up winning the game. But, man, it was scary to see that that that, uh, that happened and that could have how that could have sort of broken the, the, the game uh, open for the Diamondbacks there. But it didn't, and the Mets held on to win 3-2. to two. The Mets got their three runs, um, of course, by Todd Frazier. Uh, Frazier drove in all three runs for the Mets out of the eighth spot in the lineup last night. Uh, and, of course, before the game much much maligned decision to start Frazier over J.D. Davis in third. Um, turns out to be the right decision last night because, of course, Frazier had a great game and Davis sat on the bench, and that's fine. Um, the, the thing is, right now, with all of these guys now at full capacity, with everybody here, this is the way the lineup's going to be from day to day. I mean, it, there's really not going to be a fixed set lineup 
probably outside of Alonzo, um, maybe uh, Alonzo, Conforto, and maybe McNeil. I think we're going to see a lot of mixing and matching with uh, other guys in other positions and other lineup configurations. Um, Wilson Ramos is another one who might end up being in there more often than not just because of his bat. But um, as um, as I'm going to talk about in just a bit, uh, there, there's been some discussion internally that end up leaking, of course, because it always does, uh, about Syndergaard's desire to have someone other than Ramos be his catcher. And we're going to talk about that in a bit. But, you know, Ramos's value is that he's one of the best hitters on the team. And for a while there, while everybody was... was um, while a lot of guys were on the, on the injured list and not available, um, Ramos's bat really helped carry this lineup and carry the team. But now they're at full strength, and maybe Ramos's bat in the lineup isn't as important as it might have been a few weeks ago. And again, I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, the uh, the other point from last night, before we get any further, um, two, two pieces. Um, number one, the Cubs lost, as I said, in walk-off fashion. The uh, Padres beat the Cubs, so the Mets pick up a game on the Cubs. Now three games out um, of the of the second wild card with 18 to play. And the other real sad news from last night was that Christian Yelich fouled the ball off of his kneecap uh, and will miss the rest of the season. And that sucks. That really it sucks for the Brewers who are uh, ahead of the Mets in the wild card chase, and it just sucks for baseball because Yelich was going to win the MVP again. And I think and it's, he's going to miss the last three weeks of the season, and that's going to pretty much kill his chances to win that MVP, I, I think, uh, particularly if things continue to progress with Anthony Rendon and Freddie Freeman having a, an amazing year. Just, there are just other guys who are going to more than likely over the last segment of the season uh, surpass what Yelich has done up to this point. Uh, and don't don't count out Pete Alonso either. I, I'm serious about that. There there is a very good chance that Alonso is um, that Alonso is in the MVP mix, and Yelich's injury is likely to to catapult Alonso up a little bit even even more close to the front of the pack. So um, that's it from from last night. I, I said that I would touch on something from um, from yesterday that I didn't get to talk about and this was something that came out on Monday and then it was expanded on yesterday and I, I didn't get to talk about it in the morning so um, here's the deal Noah Syndergaard and I'm going to wave to my daughter because I'm driving past my house sorry <laughs> uh, so here's the deal um, Noah Syndergaard uh, made a comment about um, Wilson Ramos being his, his catcher Right, and that was something that came up a few times earlier this year. It looked like it was dead and buried, but once again, Syndergaard had. And I'm not going to use the word complained. I'm going to say that he voiced concerns over his drastic numbers, the difference in his numbers between pitching to Wilson Ramos and for the sake of argument, not Wilson Ramos. So it's been Tomas Nito and Rene Rivera, both of whom have led Syndergaard to a sub-3 ERA. And when you contrast that to what Syndergaard's done when Ramos is behind the plate, it's a it's over a plus a five plus ERA. So um, we're talking about drastic number di- number differences here, and I, I mean it's hard to it's hard for me to not say like Syndergaard should shut his mouth and figure out how to pitch. And we we've seen a, a plethora of stories over the last uh, you know couple of days, and really more so yesterday and today, uh, with headlines like he's good enough for Degrom, but he's not good enough for Syndergaard, and Syndergaard should shut up and pitch, and he should figure out how to do it. And honestly, none of those things are wrong. They're, they're not. Um, yes, the pitcher should learn how to catch, uh, should learn how to throw to the catcher. Um, the yes, Syndergaard should be fine because Ram, uh, Degrom is fine. But look, they're not the same guys. Right? I mean, Syndergaard and DeGrom are different people. They have different styles. They have different approaches. They have different pitch sequences they like, sequences that they like to, like to throw. The, the, saying, saying that, making that argument is just saying that Syndergaard is a clone of DeGrom. And it's not true. I mean, they're different pitchers. And if, if Syndergaard's more comfortable throwing the ball to... Um, if Syndergaard's more comfortable throwing the ball to someone other than Wilson Ramos, at this point in the season... With the 
with the, the offense sort of at full strength, perhaps it's worth not it's worth resting Wilson Ramos on days when Syndergaard is starting and and, and getting the the better performance out of the pitcher than then it would be to worry about well we need Ramos's bat in the lineup because he drives in so many runs uh, and because he gets on base and those things are all true but if Syndergaard's going to give up three fewer runs across nine innings is is Ramos going to be responsible for driving in three runs or scoring some some combination of driving in slash scoring three runs? Maybe, but I'd say that the numbers support the Syndergaard argument more than anything else. And more than anything else with this whole thing is this, this story leaks, and this is a big problem with the Mets. Stories seem to leak out of the Mets camp all the time, and I can't figure out why. And at first, my, my first reaction was, I mean, this has to have been leaked by Syndergaard. But then listening to Noah talk yesterday, I mean, look, this isn't like an Academy Award-winning actor that we're talking about here, right? <laughs> right? I mean, this is, Syndergaard's a goof, and he, he's, he's not going to be putting on a face that, that says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not being sincere about this. He seemed very genuine when he said, we, we, I wasn't livid, I wasn't mad, I was just, I'm voicing a concern. I'm trying to figure out why this is <coughs> and see if the organization can do anything to help me. And that's sort of what Brody said and saying like, and what Mickey said too, like, look, I, I understand his concerns, but we got to play the best players. This is where Mickey has to put on his big boy pants and get everybody together here and say, Wilson, this is not about you. And for Wilson Ramos, uh, uh, for his case and from his point of view, he's been an absolute pro about this. He hasn't complained. You haven't heard anything at all about him. He has not let this Syndergaard stuff affect his ability to catch the other pitchers in the rotation, nor has it affected his his offensive abilities. So you got to tip your cap to Wilson Ramos for just doing a fantastic job to not let this noise bother him. But anyway, what I was saying is Mickey needs to get these guys together and say, Noah, I understand. I get it. We're going to see what we can do to make this work for you. Wilson, we need to rest you at least one day a week, perhaps two. If it's okay with you, we're going to rest you on the days when Syndergaard pitches. How hard is that? I mean, really, when you boil it down, instead of making this into a big deal, and forget about the fact that it leaked, instead of making this a big deal and a big debate, rest, rest Ramos, give him that day of rest when Syndergaard's on the mound. And if, it, if it's that big of an impact on Syndergaard's ability to pitch better, if, if it means that Noah Syndergaard is going to be able to throw up seven, eight innings of two runs allowed, what are we complaining about? There you go. Uh, and I, I'm going to give a, a hat tip to uh, my friend Mad Wax on YouTube, who actually commented on the whole Ramos offense is not necessary thing now that the guys are all back. And he's right. So I think that's a smart way to play this. Uh, rest Ramos when Syndergaard's pitching, and don't make this into a thing that's bigger than it actually needs to be. Um, Mets continue their series tonight. Steven Matz on the hill. Uh, Matz has pitched very well in the second half. Let's see if he can continue this evening. I will be back tomorrow to recap it and hopefully talk about the Mets picking up yet another game in the wild card and getting that much closer to a playoff berth. Until then, I thank you for watching. I appreciate it, as I always do. Follow me on Twitter if you're not already, at Mr. Underscore Met. And as always, let's go Mets.